Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you this morning. Will you please stand and we'll begin our service with an opening prayer to invoke the presence of God and the great ones to be with us this morning. Let's close our eyes and pray from our hearts with deep concentration, feeling the presence of the great ones with us. Heavenly Father, Mother, friend, beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yoganandaji. Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from restlessness to peace, from nervousness to calmness, and from death to immortality. Be thou the only one reigning on the throne of all our thoughts and desires. Om, peace, amen. Please be seated. One of the most inspiring things about Self-Realization Fellowship teachings is that our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, spoke, wrote, lived, not a philosophy or a theory, but from actual experience of God. And so everything he experienced in his communion with God, he is relating to all of us in his teachings to encourage each one of us to make the same effort so that we can have that same tangible, conscious experience of God in our lives. Explaining to us that God is not at some distant space in the universe, but he is right within us. He has become each one of us. The essence of our beings is the soul image of spirit right within us. And so everything in the Guru's teachings is to arouse that uh, greater enthusiasm and desire for God in our lives. And he has told us that if we make the effort, if we are really interested, that these teachings can take us as far as we want to go to God himself. In one of his lectures, the guru said, In the science of yoga meditation, India has given the answer to how to find him. I traveled through that land. I sat at the feet of a true master. I am not only convinced that God is, but I give you my testimony of his presence. If you heed my words, from your own realization, you too shall someday say that God is. You shall know I tell you the truth. Guruji goes on to say, every blade of grass, every spark of fire, every thought you think testifies to his presence, his intelligence. He is the source whence all things come, but you are not conscious of him. India specialized in the science of going to that source. And that science is the science of yoga meditation, whereby we learn how to take our energy and our consciousness that is normally going out into this world, identified with this material world, which is only transitory. There's past, present, future, but it is always changing. The only thing that is not changing is God. And when we learn how to reverse the energy and the consciousness to go inside, then we begin to perceive that presence of God within us. And that is what each one of us desires deep within our souls, to have that experience. And what is God? He is peace. He is love. He is ever new joy. And we, we crave for those qualities because we know that we are made in that image, that we too are peace. We are love. We are that joy 
And it's just a matter of tapping that source within us through meditation. So as we always do in our services and self-realization fellowship, let us have a period of meditation. We're sitting with the spine erect, lifting the gaze to the point between the eyebrows. This is the Christ Consciousness Center. With the hands resting on the thighs near the juncture of thigh and abdomen, with the palms upturned. And then being very relaxed in this position. The spine needs to be erect because in the spine there are centers of life and consciousness. And we are trying to withdraw that life and consciousness inside and upward into those centers of life and consciousness in the brain and in the spine. To help take us into meditation, we'll chant. Chanting helps us to arouse the devotion, the love for God, and concentration. When we chant one of our Guru's cosmic chants, he has spiritualized these. He has had that actual experience of God while chanting these words to God. So when we do chant, do it with great devotion and great concentration, forgetting everything else outside of ourselves and going deep within. And then we'll just sit for a few minutes in that stillness of meditation, communing with God. If you know the techniques, like Hong Sa technique, practice that. If you don't, then it's fine just to repeat some phrase of the chant or some prayer of your heart, such as reveal thyself, reveal thyself. I am thy child, you must come to me. Let us chant, door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? My days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Door of my heart, open wide I keep for thee. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Wilt thou come, wilt thou come, just for once come to me. Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Will my days fly away without seeing thee, my Lord? Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day, I look for thee night and day. Night and day, night and day. I look for the night and day.
First of all, happy Halloween to everyone. Those of you who knew Brother Anandamoy, oftentimes he would refer to this drama of life with all its twists and turns and scary events as Divine Mother's Halloween show. <laughs> so we're all the characters in the, the Halloween show. In the ultimate sense, this is Divine Mother's show. Everything comes from the thought of God. In the beginning, before this, all, this whole creation was developed, it was just pure spirit. And then when spirit decided to create, spirit put that thought into the ether. And then the thought became further condensed into light and energy, and then energy into matter. And the show that we're seeing here today is all part of God's thought. And of all God's thoughts in this drama of creation, his highest thought, his highest creation, is you and I, each one of us as the soul. We are all children of God. What does that mean, children of God? He created us out of his image of spirit. And so inherent and within, within each one of us is that soul image. We are pure spirit, pure love, joy, wisdom. And the whole purpose of life is to reach down deep in within ourselves and to discover that true nature of what we truly are. Our subject today is overcoming nervousness. And to understand what nervousness is and how to overcome it, we have to understand a little bit of the physiology of the body because this body is what houses the soul. And this, bo this body that we have is a wonderful creation of God. And the main aspects of this body is the nervous system. And there are two parts of the nervous system. One is the central nervous system, which is the brain, the medulla oblongata, and the spine. And then the peripheral nervous system, which are the nerves that reach out into all the organs and the sensory perceptions of this world. So we experience this world through our nervous system. What we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch comes through the nerves and it goes to the brain. And Master said that in the brain there's the gray matter on the surface of the brain. And that's where all these neurological sparks take place. And what is so important in understanding the nervous system is that we control our nerves through our thoughts. Nervousness is caused somewhat by environment and karma and so forth, but primarily with our thoughts. What are we thinking throughout the day? And we'll get a little bit more into this subject as we talk a little bit about the, the history of, of the world and modern civilization and where we are today because the Master said that nervousness is the disease of civilization. Here we are today. In the 18th and 19th centuries, our world went through two industrial revolutions where the socioeconomic, the uh, psychological, the, the social aspects, the political, all the aspects of life were changed dramatically. In the Industrial Revolution, when the internal combustion engine was discovered, the um, electrical uh, generators and so forth, so the world had a complete changeover in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it's very interesting to understand this because if you understand about the yugas that Sri Yukteswar taught and our guru taught, that the world goes through 12,000 years of ascending consciousness, 12,000 years of descending. 
And we are just in the beginning of the ascending cycle. That was a transition from the dark Kali Yuga, materialistic age, when we first started to discover electricity and so forth. And that's when Kriya Yoga and the science of yoga was reintroduced into the world. Because in the dark ages, in the materialistic age of Kali Yuga, the concept of energy, electricity, was unknown. Just this material world was known. Now as we are ascending, we are understanding the electrical forces. And that is why Dwapara Yuga, which we are in now, is the age of electrical and atomic discoveries. And the, yoga, the science of yoga is based upon controlling the energy or the electricity in the body. You see how it all works together in God's plan. It's beautiful. Guruji wrote, he said, Babaji, Mahavatar Babaji, is well aware of the trend of modern times, especially of the influence and complexities of Western civilization, and realizes the necessity of spreading the self-liberations of yoga equally in the West and in the East. So Babaji had told Swami Sri Teshwar that he would send to him a disciple, that he would train and bring this yoga science to the West. And that disciple, of course, was Paramahansa Yogananda, our guru, who came to America in 1920. Just as this electrical age is beginning to become manifest and more and more people are understanding the necessity of having a technique, having a scientific approach to God. Not just theory, not just intellectuality, but actual experience of God. Just to give a little bit of an example of this industrial age that we're in and the industrial age moving into the, the age of, of communication, technology, and so forth that we're in today. A few years ago, I read a magazine article that said, in one year, the average American will read or complete 3,000 notices and forms, read 100 newspapers and 36 magazines, watch 2,463 hours of television, listen to 730 hours of radio, buy 20 cassettes or uh, CDs, or now it's probably MP3s, it's all digital now, talk on the telephone, they said, for almost 61 hours. Now that we all have our mobile phones, I'm sure it's more than 61 hours. And read three books. <laughs> but just to give you an idea of, this was a number of years ago too, and the communication, the information that is coming to us, it makes uh, modern civilization so complex. So much is coming at us. We have to use our discrimination as to how we are adapting to this modern 21st century. Guruji said, most nervous diseases are due to overexcitation of the mind. Overexcitation of the mind. You think about that. We reflect about in our own lives how much information are we absorbing every day and that causes the fluctuations in the mind. We cannot prevent the progress of technology that is going on in the world. That's inherent. That's the destiny of the world. But what we can do is control how we adapt to it, how we interact with the technology, with the communications, with all the advances that are taking place in the world. The world suggests to us that we need more and more all the time, isn't it? And we have to have something new all the time. But what happens is that when we have these desires for things in the world, that causes frustration. And that frustration causes anger. And anger is one of the worst things for the nervous system. It burns up the nervous system. Because when we have certain desires for sensory objects, sensory pleasures, certain expectations in this world, whether it's with uh, a relationship or 
owning possessions, or whatever it may be, and our, those desires are frustrated, then we become angry. And that shoots all kinds of excess energy into the nerves, into the nervous system, and burns out the nervous system. Not only the communications and technology and so forth, but the overcrowding of civilization today. Freeway systems. I mean, look at road rage. You know, people get angry when they're on... I know I... When I drive sometimes, that's one of the most frustrating things if you're in traffic and you can't get anywhere. And then the mind can start playing tricks on you and, and people get upset and they start honking their horns. It's, it's like one man said that he saw um, a bumper sticker on a car that said, Honk if you love Jesus. And so he honked and the guy raised his fist at the guy. <laughs> and he figured, well, it probably wasn't his car then. But things like that in our everyday lives, you know, it's so easy to get frustrated, to get angry. And in our Bhagavad Gita passage today from chapter 2, the Lord Krishna addresses this. It's a very deep, deep passage in the Gita. Krishna said, brooding on sense objects causes attachment to them. Attachment breeds craving. Craving breeds anger. Anger breeds delusion. Delusion breeds loss of memory of the self, the higher self. Loss of right memory causes decay of the discriminating faculty. From decay of discrimination, annihilation of spiritual life follows. See what he's saying here? It's just that, you know, when we desire things, we get frustrated and then we get angry. And we get angry, we forget our true nature. What is our true nature? Calm, pure spirit. And that is one of the ways that we'll talk about how to overcome nervousness is to learn to be more calm, more centered within ourselves. In his commentary, Guruji says about this passage, visualizing sensory happiness produces an increasing attachment to that feeling of attraction. Such attachment becomes crystallized into an active desire for acquirement, giving birth to crafty cravings, the pernicious foe of peace. Crafty cravings, he said, pernicious foe of peace. And we're all striving to attain greater peace in our lives. The peace that is born of meditation and that we carry from our meditations into our daily activities. That peace which surpasseth all understanding. That's what we want to hold on to to overcome nervousness. Desires unfulfilled enmesh man in the travails of anger. Wrath creates a distorting cloud of delusion. From delusion flows the loss of memory and self-respect of one's own position and normal behavior. From a mangled memory of one's proper self exudes the stench of decayed discrimination. When discrimination degenerates, the destruction of the spiritual life follows. So he's giving a very succinct and poignant advice here to get control of our emotions, to get control of our desires and our attachments. We have, it's normal that we have to fulfill certain things, certain desires in our lives, but not to be attached to them. The more we can be de detached, the more peace we will find in our lives. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American philosopher, said, For every minute you remain angry, you give up 60 seconds of peace of mind. And who causes the anger sometimes that we feel or frustration? We do. We have that control. And we have to understand that with that control, the more we have emotions like anger or fear or worry or resentment flowing into our, our lives from our thoughts, the more restriction there is in the nerves and they can't, that energy can't go to the sense organs. It's like 
uh, this German uh, physicist, his name was Ohm, and there was a law called the Ohm's Law, and this is not the Ohm vibration, the cosmic Ohm vibration, but this is a German physicist, his name was Ohm, O-H-M, Ohm. And this is in the 19th century, and he said that in electricity, the amount of current that will flow in electrical circuit will always be inversely proportional to resistance in the circuit. So the more resistance there is in that, that flow, the less energy that can go flow into there. That resistance in our lives are these emotions of fear, worry, anger. I had a personal experience of this that was very dramatic to me. Um, this was maybe 30 years ago. And I began working as Uma Mata's secretary. And at that time, Uma Mata was the, the general manager of Self-Realization Fellowship. And much of the, the operational work in SRF would come to her desk. And um, in about 1989, I was asked to be Uma Mata's secretary. And I was a little bit nervous, of course, to be her secretary, but I met with her the first time. And uh, we met up on the second floor of the administration building and she brought with her a couple of banana boxes, large banana boxes. And they were filled with folders with files in them, all, a whole bunch of back history of different projects she was working on. And she gave both of them to me. And being sort of a, you know, a, a, sometimes aggressive, you know, I started to think I've got to get everything done at once. So I took them back to my office and I worked on some of them and we met again a couple days later and I was asking her questions and she looked at me, she paused and she looked at me and she said, you know, you're very intense. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that I hadn't thought of myself as that intense person, but she was right. And you could almost um, transfer that intenseness to emotions, to frustration, to anxiety. So I thought then and there, I've got to slow down. I can't do everything at one time. Just take one thing at a time. And whenever I would forget that and I would get intense again, she would remind me. She said, you know, you're getting very intense. <laughs> and that intenseness, in intensity is good if it's also accompanied with calmness and peace. But if that intensity has frustration and tenseness or stress or strain, then it's damaging to the nervous system. Anger, Master says, burns out the nerves. We have to learn to be calm. It's like this story of a famous samurai swordsman. He went to uh, a Zen master and he wanted to impress the Zen master with his, his understanding of life. And he said, you know, everything, including you and me, is emptiness. It's all empty. And so the... the um, Zen master picked up his cane and he hit the swordsman on top of the head. And he, he pulled out his sword. He was ready to attack the, the master. And the, the Zen master said, emptiness is quick to anger, isn't it? <laughs> so we have to not only have the philosophy, but we also have to empty ourselves from these expectations, these desires, these frustrations. You know, there was an event in Master's life when he was very young. Some of you may have read the book Mejda. And Mejda means second eldest brother. And our guru's brother, Sananda Lalgos, uh, wrote this book about the early experiences when they were brothers together growing up. And he tells of one experience when Mejda, or Mukunda at that time, was uh, um, a young boy going to school. And there was a bully in their school. And this bully would always attack the younger, smaller students. And finally, Master had enough of this, and he went to the bully and he said, what are you doing? He says, fight with me instead. And this bully was even was bigger than, than Master was. So they fought, they were fighting together, and the bully picked up Master and he threw him on the ground, and he started to bang his head on the ground. Guruji uh, grabbed the, the bully by the neck, and he had him in a hole like that. And Master said to him, he said, until you give up, he said, I'm not going to release the hold. Say you give up, say you give up, and you won't pick on anybody else. 
And finally, the bully did that. He said, okay, I give up. So Master let go of him. The young boy, Makunda, let go of him. And he started to walk away. And the bully went and he attacked. He began to attack Makunda again. And then all the friends that were around there um, protected Makunda. And they said, look, at he won fair and square. He said, if you attack him, you attack all of us. But the point of the story is that Master, rather than feeling victorious and wonderful about beating the bully, he felt badly that he got angry. And this is what he said. This is what uh, Sananda wrote. He said, Mejda became known as the protector of the weak. But later he repented the anger that had driven him into the conflict. As it dawned upon him that his anger had been uncontrolled, the biting pain of his conscience far outweighed his physical pain from getting beaten by that, that bully. He knew that anger has no place in the life of one who has faith in God, for it blots out the very thought of God. He resolved that never again would he give way to anger. Many times after that I saw others hurt him, but he had never expressed any anger or lost his temper. When friends were wrong, he firmly reproved them, repeatedly if necessary, but it was always with the greatest patience and inner calm. We see that the guru goes through these life's experiences to teach us the same types of lessons that he learned, that he went through. That, yeah, sometimes we, we feel justified in getting angry, but if we are angry with someone else, it doesn't help them, it doesn't help us. It clogs up the nervous system. It doesn't allow that supply of energy to go into the higher centers in the spine and the brain. You probably have heard that story of Master. There was a Hindu writer that was always arguing with everybody else. And so he came to Master one time and he said to him, How much are you making? How much money are you making? He thought that because of Guruji's lectures, he was making a lot of money. And the disciples that were in the room, they wanted to throw the guy out. And so Master very calmly said no. He told the disciples, Leave him alone. And he said, Maybe you are right. Maybe you are right. He didn't say, yes, you are right. He said, maybe you are right. And then finally the man kept going on and Master kept saying, maybe you are right. Maybe you are right. And then after some time, Guruji asked his friends to leave the room. And the writer, this Hindu writer, slumped back on his chair and he said, for the first time I have been licked because of Master's calmness and his patience. And he said, Guruji said to him, don't think I am not going to give it to you. Tell me why is it that an intelligent man like you behaves in this way? You are only advertising your bad behavior and showing the kind of person you are. I was concerned only for you that my friends didn't harm you. And the, mass, and the, uh, the man said, you are right. Tell me more. So Guruji said, you know, vultures soar high in the sky, but their whole mind is on the carrion on the ground below. They wait their chance and they sweep down to pick the dead meat. That is the way you behave. Whenever people are gossiping and fighting, there you love to go and pick at the bones. You are known everywhere for your bad behavior. So he said, well, what do I do then? So Guruji gave him the advice. He said, whenever there is gossiping or quarreling, leave at once. Don't contribute to that environment. He says, because then the devil is using you. The best thing under such circumstances is to remain quiet. So this is a way that the, the guru is teaching us too, to remain quiet, to remain calm, to remain peaceful. Guruji said, nervousness, the overstimulation of the nerves ties the consciousness to the body. Calmness conduces to God communion. So we see that this nervousness, when we are nervous, we are tied to the body. The energy is going outward through the, the nerves and the sensory organs. When we are calm, when we are at peace within, and especially when we learn to meditate 
and practice the scientific techniques of meditation, especially Kriya, we learn to withdraw that energy. And then what does Master say? Where the energy is, there is the consciousness. So in meditation, we learn to become more and more calm. The mind settles down, the breath settles down, the heart beats more slowly, and then we begin to perceive what we truly are as peaceful souls, not as nervous or restless beings. Sri Gyanamata, one of the great disciples of our guru, one time said, calmness is the soil and the only soil in which all that we most desire to be will grow. Calmness is the soil, the only soil into which everything that we desire the most to be will grow. So if we get nothing else from this lecture this morning is the idea of learning to be more calm, learning to be more poised, centered. And that comes more and more through our meditations, through holding on to the peace of meditation, not thinking that, okay, my meditation is over, now I can go out into the world and be a rascal. But no, we have to hold on to that peace and be a, 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 like a God all the time, not just in our meditations. In the Bible passage today from St. John, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And Guruji in his commentary says, what Jesus meant by this advice and these promises might be more fully expressed as follows. Do not trouble your heart, the feeling aspect of your consciousness, no matter what trials come to you. Keep your meditation-born spiritual perception fixed on the imperturbability of cosmic consciousness beyond creation and Christ consciousness present in creation. Regardless of troubles, remain securely focused on the divine consciousness on both planes, in the cosmic vibratory region and the quiescent realm beyond all vibrations. Let not your heart be troubled. That is another great message for each one of us in this crazy world, this crazy um, Divine Mother's Halloween show where there's all these ups and downs and twists and turns. Let not your heart be troubled. As we become more peaceful individuals, we control that nervous system where the energy is flowing smoothly. It's not obstructed by fear or resentment or worry or anger. One of the other great disciples besides Gyanamata was Roger Sijana Kananda, great self-made multimillionaire. When he first met the master in 1932 in Kansas City, he said, my life was business, but my soul was sick and my body was decaying and my mind was disturbed. I was so nervous, I couldn't sit still. Imagine. But then he met the master and the first time he met him, he sat perfectly still and he saw the light of God and he meditated for many hours with master. And then later on he said, since that time, I have been free from nervousness. On the path of self-realization, one becomes alive again. He actually lives. He feels the divine life within him. So another great example is Roger C. Janakananda. You think about that. His whole life was business. He was so nervous he couldn't sit still. But through that contact with the Master, with the teachings, with practicing meditation, he could sit for hours in that stillness and that calmness and that peace. And he attained the highest state of God realization. A wonderful example for all of us. We have in the energization exercises that Master has given to us, one of the pranayama techniques, learning how through the agency of the willpower to draw that energy into the body, direct it into the different body parts. It's a wonderful way of preparing our bodies and our minds for 
sitting in meditation. So along with the energization exercises, we have pranayama techniques. Prana, life force. Yama, control. Controlling that energy. I mean, we are so fortunate to think about the time that we were born. Even though these are complex times, there's a lot of conflict in the world, we have these teachings from the higher ages to show us how we can rise above Dwapara Yuga and live in our consciousness in the higher golden spiritual ages. Guruji said in his autobiography, In men under Maya or natural law, the flow of life energy is toward the outward world. The currents are wasted and abused in the senses. The practice of Kriya reverses the flow. The life force is mentally guided to the inner cosmos and becomes reunited with subtle spinal energies. By such reinforcement of life force, the yogi's body and brain cells are renewed by a spiritual elixir. So just to summarize, this whole drama, this whole show is a thought of God. And He has thought of each one of us. His highest thought is each one of us as the soul. But we also have these wonderful human forms which houses the soul with the nervous system. The central nervous system of the brain, medulla, the spine, and the peripheral nervous system where we interact with the world. We need to interact with the world, but we need to do so in a calm, peaceful manner. But then, the central nervous system is the most important because in the spine and the brain are those divine life and energy, life and consciousness centers. As we practice Kriya, we take the energy up the spine into the, the brain and this is what we're trying to do in our meditations, living more and more in that divine calm presence of God. I'd like to close with these words of the Guru. He said, When your mind is anchored in soul consciousness, then peace, poise, and happiness will be reflected in all you say and do. And its harmonious vibrations will have a healing influence on the body also. Every night before going to bed, affirm with deep peace, I am a prince of peace, sitting on the throne of poise. Poise is your center. The soul is ever in perfect equilibrium. When you are in tune with your soul, your real self, then whether you act quickly or slowly, you will never lose your kingly attitude of peace. Let us spend just a few moments in prayer, praying for the well-being of all those who have asked for healing of body, mind, and soul, and also to pray for greater peace and harmony throughout the world. Will you please stand now and we'll have our healing service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. 
Thou art in all thy children. Thou art in them. Thou art in us. Manifest thy healing presence in our bodies, minds, and souls. Let's raise our arms and chant Om for the healing of the body. Om. For healing of the mind. Om. For healing of soul ignorance. Om. Let us chant Om for greater peace and harmony in the world. Om. Let's fold our hands and pray. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Divine Mother, Help me to be a prince of peace, sitting on the throne of poise, directing the kingdom of all my activities. Om, peace, amen.